Uh, speaker number one is uh, Dan Lamb, uh, Office of U.S. Uh, Representative uh, Hinchy. Please come to the microphone and address the audience. Speak clearly, spell your name for our stenographer. Thanks. Dan Lamb, D-A-N-L-A-M-B. It's great to be here tonight. It's great to be first. I think it has less to do with who I work with than the fact that I have my 11-year-old with me who hasn't had dinner. So I'll try and be brief, but it's uh, good to be here on behalf of Congressman Morris Hinchy, who is in Washington today for votes. I want to thank TCOG for the opportunity to comment on the revised draft supplemental generic environmental impact statement on horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing in the Marcellus Shale. Maurice appreciates the hard work that Commissioner Martins and his staff have invested in this document. In addition, DEC has lost many staff over the past few years, making this task all the more difficult. Despite this sincere effort, Maurice believes that the Eskice falls far short of what is needed to protect local communities from the risk po posed by shale, drill, sh shale gas drilling and does not fully mitigate potential threats to public health, drinking water, air quality, and municipal infrastructure. Two years ago, Maurice, in response to the first draft, provided 11 detailed recommendations to mitigate the risk of shale gas drilling. These included a cumulative impact study, a ban on the use of toxic chemicals in fracking fluids, a requirement for full public disclosure of all chemicals used in the fracking process, more DE staff to oversee drilling operations, phased in development of new well pads, and more. Unfortunately, none of these recommendations are included in the new SGIS, and others are only partially addressed. We have learned much more about hydraulic fracturing since 2009. More incidents of broken industry promises, harm to local communities, air pollution, and water contamination have been reported. Just recently, in Pavilion, Wyoming, the EPA found fracking chemicals in well water. These incidences raise serious new concerns that are not addressed by the revised SGIS. Recently, physicians and other health professionals from around New York State called for a full assessment of the public health impacts of gas exploration and production. The SGIS omits this critical review, and Congressman Hinchy agrees that the state should conduct a health impact assessment. In addition, EPA has begun a new study on the impact of fracking on water resources that Congressman Hinchy initiated. This study is expected to produce initial results by the end of next year. The EPA is also developing rules to protect the public from toxic air pollutants that are emitted by gas drilling sites. Congressman Hinchy believes it would be irresponsible and unwise for New York to allow new shale, shale gas drilling before these actions are completed. The consequences of failing to safeguard our water resources, air quality, and public health would far outweigh the purported economic benefits associated with drilling. Congressman Hinchy, pages stuck together. Congressman Hinchy believes the current SGIS does not provide these prote protections and should be rejected. Thank you very much. Our second speaker is Martha Robertson, who's the chair of the Tompkins County Legislature. Thank you, Martha, M-A-R-T-H-A, Robertson, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-O-N. The revised SGIS is better, thanks in large part to the 14,000 public comments on the previous draft, and yet many of our most significant comments on the first version have not yet been addressed. Our planning department has written comments that our legislature will consider next Tuesday. Unfortunately, whole sections of these new observations could have been taken verbatim from our 2009 comments. For example, the document still doesn't deal adequately with cumulative impacts, even though the DEC admitted in 2010 that this gap was one of the most frequent comments by the public. Every EIS is required to focus on cumulative impacts rather than allowing segmentation. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean the DEC can brush it off. The document fails to establish thresholds of activity that the human and natural environment could sustain without permanent damage. The spacing unit is the only limiting factor on development. It's the DEC's job to establish a pace and, and extent of development that the environment could tolerate rather than leaving it up to the industry. The socioeconomic analysis it failed to analyze or quantify the negative impacts of drilling, a stunning omission. It doesn't address the serious long-term adverse effects of a boom and bust economy or the cost to local governments 
or issues of equity, when a few people will get rich while the rest of the community pays the cost. The overwhelming truck traffic will have devastating economic and social effects even if the industry eventually repairs the infrastructure. The many continuing flaws in the Eskies include failure to assess the industrialization of our rural landscapes and the life cycle analysis of greenhouse gas emissions from natural gas. There's still no adequate plan for cleaning the wastewater. The failure to address the cumulative impacts is a fatal flaw all by itself. The only conclusion that can be drawn from the document is, there, is that there are no measures that New York State is willing or able to require that would sufficiently mitigate the negative impacts of shale gas drilling. Therefore, until and unless a more benign technology is developed and required, fracking should not be permitted. A total statewide ban is the only appropriate mitigation. If a total ban can't be achieved, the DEC should honor local home rule, as many other states currently do. Home rule would place the decision about whether to allow drilling at the local level. The responsibility to regulate the process of drilling itself should remain with the professionals at DEC. Thanks to the state's moratorium and DEC's ESCAI's process and public comment periods, localities are relatively well equipped today to understand the trade-offs inherent with this industry. DEC can and should write this support for local home rule into the ESCAI's, and I'm submitted tonight a memo outlining how that could be done. Municipal home rule has been and remains one of New York's unique and important political features. The principle has seldom been more significant to the people of the state as it is in this debate. Thank you. So, so I politely remind the audience that we can get through more speakers faster if we find non-audible ways to communicate our, our feelings. I see there are many people in the audience that have such ideas. Our next speaker is uh, Sarah Hess. If you could please speak your name clearly and spell it for the, our stenographer. Yes. Sarah, S-A-R-A, Hess, H-E-S-S. -S. I live in Ithaca. The drinking water from my faucet starts as surface water. Six Mile Creek and its tributaries feed into two reservoirs owned and operated by the city of Ithaca. I've studied the watershed map for Six Mile Creek. It's big. Ithaca's water comes from an area that includes about a third of Caroline, two chunks of Dryden, part of Danby, and part of the town of Ithaca. I also looked at the map that shows gas leases in those areas and saw that a great deal of land has been leased to the gas companies. Many experts have told us that the biggest environmental threat of water contamination is from human error that leads to surface spills. If drilling is allowed in Ithaca's watershed, we know from Pennsylvania's experience that accidents would like overturned trucks, faulty valves on storage tanks, and leaking open pits would carry contamination downhill to the nearest valley and creek. Ithaca's water filtering and treatment system is not designed to remove toxic waste nor hazardous chemicals used for shale drilling. So, what protection does the DEC give to the 30,000 people who drink Ithaca's water? Well, hardly any. The two reservoirs would have a 2,000 foot buffer zone where no drilling pads would be allowed. But the real exposure, of course, is in the streams and creeks that fill those reservoirs. Here, the DEC relies on a 1992 setback rule of 150 feet from a public stream. This regulation was put in place 20 years before shale gas drilling came along. In today's world, Marcellus drilling requires 27 thousand gallons of chemicals to be transported and used for each well that is drilled. And here's the kicker. In the July draft of the Eskies, a longer setback protection of 500 feet was put on either side of a tributary that feeds into a public drinking water supply. But in the October draft, that protection was mysteriously taken out with no explanation. I have to wonder, who made that decision and why? Colorado has a stream set back of 300 feet. New Mexico, 1,000 feet. But New York has only 150 feet. 
I'm here to say that any gas drilling activity within the watersheds of any municipal water supply must be prohibited. Thank you. Our next speaker, number four, is Robert Howarth. Okay. Um, I think we should probably stick what's, uh, with what's on my sheet, if you don't, if you don't mind going now. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for TCOG for organizing this. Uh, my name is Bob Howarth, B-O-B-H-O-W-A-R-T-H. I want to shortly address some of the scientific failings with the uh, draft S guys. I'm a, a scientist, an environmental scientist. I've worked on water quality and greenhouse gas emissions, including oil and gas industries, for 35 years. I was really uh, pleased to hear last summer that Governor Cuomo announced the importance of using science in the decision-making process for determining how to proceed with fracking. It's a challenge. It's a big challenge because shale gas development is new. Outside of Texas, where it's only been going on for 10 or 12 years, elsewhere in the country, it's only been going on in any major way for three, four, or five years. And so the science is new and we are just learning. Almost all of the scientific literature on shale gas has come out in the last 12 months, 15 months perhaps, and a lot of it in the last nine months. So it's a moving target. That's a real challenge for the DEC. And unfortunately, they totally failed to meet that challenge. They almost completely missed all of the important literature that's come out in the past year or so. I want to give you three examples. First is the size of the resource. They're using in their s guys estimates which came from the Department of Energy. The U.S. Geological Survey put out a uh, new assessment of the Marcellus Shale resource last summer. It said that the Department of Energy had overestimated the resource fivefold. So a lot less gas there. The Department of Energy agreed. They said, yes, the USGS are the real experts in this. Uh, we're wrong. But the DEC has yet to change it. They're still using the wrong inflated numbers. And that, of course, highly affects the cost-benefit analysis. Second issue is the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas. Uh, this is something I've taken on as a personal research topic. We've published two papers on it now. We have a third one in press. Our work was completely ignored in the S guys, but so were seven other papers and reports that have come out in the last year. Instead, the S guys relies on an unpublished fact sheet on the website of the Chesapeake Gas Corporation from two years ago. The EPA has just redone their analysis of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with natural gas, first update since 1996. They now say that 39% of the methane emissions in the United States, all sources, come from natural gas. And when you scale that to the total greenhouse gas inventory of the entire United States, all greenhouse gases, all sources, natural gas, methane, makes up 17% of the entire footprint. The third thing I want to talk about very briefly, because if I have 20 seconds, is the distinction between New York City and Syracuse watersheds and the rest of us. The S guys readily admits that there will be surface water contamination from spills and accidents. And they say that's a threat to New York City and Syracuse. They say it's not a threat to others because of water filtration systems. They provide no scientific documentation for that. I and 58 other scientists wrote a, a letter to the governor uh, stating there's no scientific basis for that. Uh, five members of the National Academy of Sciences signed on to that. 50 other of the nation's experts in this all agreed. We got no reply from the governor, but the S guys has done a terrible job in that assessment. So, thank you. Thank you. So sorry about the numbering. Uh, I have on my list uh, Nathan as number five, Elizabeth as number six, and Sandra as number seven. So our next speaker will be Nathan Shinagawa, uh, number five. It's a Tompkins County legislator. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Nathan Shinagawa, N-A-T-H-A-N, and then S-H-I-N-A-G-A-W-A. -A it's easy. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, uh, tonight, I'm not speaking as a county legislator, but actually speaking as a uh, person that works in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. I work in healthcare uh, down there. And I travel down to Sayre uh, every day. It takes about an hour to get there, and then I travel back. And I have a lot of colleagues that have been affected very personally by what's happened with hydrofracking. Um, I have people that have concerns about public safety. 
Uh, there are people that I work with that have had commutes that have changed from 10 minutes to an hour because of the traffic that's affected the community. And then also, we have a huge economic problem there, which is high rents and the high cost of housing. And that's been huge. And so, you know, when I work in government, I often question, you know, the, the costs versus the benefits. I think that's one of the things that we have to do as leaders. And I look at that and I say, well, who benefits out of this? And obviously there's an economic benefit. There's the economic benefit, but it's for a very few group of people. And what do I mean by that? Well, I've seen firsthand the economic benefit. The economic benefit goes to large landowners. It goes to people that have the capital to build cheap hotels and camps. And it goes to out-of-state workers. But really, I've seen how it harms people. It harms the people that have the least, and with fracking, I believe that they are getting less. What do I mean that by that? Well, during the flood that affected both the southern tier of, of New York and the northern tier of Pennsylvania, I, was, uh, I worked there for several days um, at my hospital. And in the aftermath, it was so hard because some of the places that got flooded the most were the areas that had the cheapest housing. And to this day, I have a half a dozen people that I know that I work with that don't have homes. And they don't have homes because they can't afford to move anywhere because the rents have become so high. So there's a serious economic Im impact here. And so if there isn't this big economic impact, well then, you know, how can we justify these huge environmental risks? And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that this s guys, this s guys is supposed to be the document that mitigates those risks. And yet, it doesn't. I mean, we see the situation in Dimmick, Pennsylvania, how the industry has ruined 18 wells. They said they would fix it. They didn't fix it. And then they just pulled out all, <laughs> pulled out the fresh water for this community. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I think that if we want to move forward, this s guys is inadequate. What it needs is public disclosure of all chemicals that are used. It needs a cumulative impact study. It needs a public health assessment of fracking and if we do do fracking, which I hope we don't, that we actually have a plan at DEC and at the county level to have staffing so that we can have proper oversight. Also, finally, to conclude, I think that we need to give communities the power to choose whether or not they want to have fracking because the risks are so huge, and that's why home rule is so important. And also, finally, I just want to say in conclusion that seeing all of this firsthand, I don't want fracking. I've seen it, what happens in Pennsylvania, and I don't want that, want that for the people of New York, and I don't want that for the environment of New York. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, will, a uh, friendly reminder to the audience that our stenographer has to hear, uh, to transcribe ver verbatim, so if you can find non-auditory ways to, to communicate, because uh, uh, I can see that that you want to communicate your approval of many of these comments. Our next speaker is number six, uh, Elizabeth Thomas, uh, council member in the town of Ulysses. Spelled E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H-T-H-O-M-A-S. I'm the town councilman and deputy supervisor of the town of Ulysses, and also the chair of the Tompkins County Council of Government's um, gas drilling task force. Uh, so, commenting on uh, over 1,500 pages of the SGUIS plus the oddly simultaneously released regulations and the stormwater rules on drilling is nearly impossible in three minutes, so each of us needs to focus on an area of special concern. Um, as a member of a town council, my duty is to protect the health, safety, and well-being of our residents. I hasten to add that that is also the duty of the state government and the DEC. Uh, to this end, the town of Ulysses has researched the subject on high volume hydrofracking extensively, um, spending countless of hours paid and unpaid. In August, our board unanimously approved a ban on any drilling within the town limits because we felt the SGUIS was insufficient to protect the health, safety, and well being of all our residents. The proposed SGUIS has far too many flaws to reassure our town that this can be done safely. For example, since air quality and health issues remained unresolved, Drilling should not be allowed at least within a thousand feet of any residential areas, um, the same being true of our valuable creeks and lake. The Eskice ignores uh, the type of aquifer that lies beneath approximately an eighth of our town um, because it is not a primary or principal aquifer. So who will protect the residents whose wells draw from that source? And the Eskice mentions nothing about the salt mines um, and the caverns that spider throughout the rocks beneath us. 
nor does the Eskies adequately account for the unmapped abandoned gas wells that are suspected of being conduits of drilling fluids and other areas where drilling has occurred. None of these assurances are in the Eskies, and for these and a multitude of other reasons, the town of Ulysses says, not now, in our residentially dense and water-rich community. But it's questionable if the state will allow us the right to zone our land according to our locally preferred land uses. The Eskies needs to take a stronger stand in honoring the right of home rule. Finally, local governments are already bearing a huge and very expensive burden in, pre in preparation for the possibility of high volume hydrofracking. Responding to an issue of this magnitude requires time and money, but local governments, many are small, along with the majority of its residents, stand to benefit little to none. This is not the long-term economic panacea that many are making it out to be, especially when environmental and health issues um, are properly valued in the entire economic equation. Yes, some will become rich, and the rest of us will bear the burden of a reduced quality of life, along with increased taxes to foot the bill handed over to local municipalities. Thank you. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to call up the next uh, set of speakers. So this would be uh, 9 through uh, 16. Um, so please make your way uh, up to the front of the stage. Uh, the next speaker is Ken Zesserson. Oh, sorry, Sandra Steingraber. I'm so sorry, Sandra. My name is Sandra Steingraber. S-A-N-D-R-A-S-T-E-I-N-G-R-A-B-E-R. I'm a resident of Trumansburg and a biologist at Ithaca College. I've had the opportunity to speak about the public health impacts of fracking at the European Parliament, Congress, the White House, and the EPA. But nothing is more meaningful than to speak in my own community before the stage where I've watched my two children perform the story of Peter Pan. <laughs> Hydrofracking releases carcinogens and neurological poisons into the earth. It brings radioactivity, heavy metals, and toxic vapors out of deep geological strata and into our shared environment. It fills the air with smog and diesel exhaust, substances linked to stroke, heart attack, preterm birth, and asthma. It creates light and noise pollution that are linked to breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. Governor Patterson was right to issue an executive order that created a moratorium until the environmental health risks of fracking can be fully analyzed. The draft Eskice is not that analysis. Rather than assess the health impacts of fracking using the protocols of public health science, the ESGAIS simply denies that these impacts exist. Certainly the regulations proposed in the ESGAIS do not protect my children. In fact, the word children, the word pediatric, does not even appear in the document. Were the ESGAIS submitted for peer review, it would not be sent out for revision. It would be rejected. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal reports rumors of a pending deal between Governor Cuomo and Republican Senator Thomas Libis that would open up the southern tier for fracking. So I bring two messages tonight. First, the Eskice must be withdrawn. It is not a legitimate scientific inquiry. It is an infomercial. Second, carving up New York into frac and no frac zones is unacceptable. The Finger Lakes and the southern tier are two branches of the same tree. We share water, we share food, we share roadways, we share floods, we share air. We know that the prevailing winds flow from Jamestown and Elmira to Ithaca and Scaniatalus. We know that fracking-related air pollution can travel 200 miles. If you frack the southern tier, you frack us. I'm one of the lucky recipients of the Heinz Award for my, my work on environmental health. Two weeks ago, I traveled to Washington, D.C. and received this medal. It comes with a $100,000 cash prize. When scientists win awards like this, the time-honored thing is to, to vote it to one's research. If I believed that the decision whether or not to frack New York was based on science, that's what I would do, but I don't believe it. Instead, I'm donating money to organizations that are fighting fracking, not studying it. And because everyone here will not have the chance to speak tonight, I would like to donate my remaining seconds at this podium to my friends and neighbors Feel free to let the DEC hear your thoughts on the Eskice. Mm. 
and that was within three minutes. Thank you, Sandra. Our next speaker is Ken Zesserson, number eight. I'm Ken Zesserson, K-E-N-Z-E-S-E-R-S-O-N. -E uh, I'm the planning board chairman in Ulysses, New York. And I'd like to address this section on the socioeconomic impacts uh, in the SGIS. Let's remember the 2009 SGIS was severely criticized for totally neglecting community impacts of the hydrofracking invasion. The current version does indeed include a section uh, considering community impacts, but it wasn't written by the DEC. It was the work of an outside consultant, Ecology and Environment Engineering, which proudly proclaims on its website that it has, quote, streamlined permitting processes on 50,000 miles of pipeline and more than 200 pipeline and gas storage projects, unquote. So the DEC has paid a consultant that is an expert in skirting regulations to write the section on community impacts. Even a cursory glance at the map of New York State shows another great fault here. They only consider three areas in New York State as representative. That's Broome, Shemung, and Tioga. Yeah, that's funny. Delaware, Otsego, and Sullivan, and Chautauqua, and Cataragas. They completely neglect the Finger Lakes, and yet we are an area very sensitive to the hydrological incels of hydrofracking because we're laced with lakes and streams, the Finger Lakes. The word in hydro, hydro and hydrofracking means water, and they omit the Finger Lakes. They cannot be serious. <laughs> The report does address the Finger Lakes obliquely. It says, quote, some industries in the regional economies may contract as a result of the proposed development. Negative externalities associated with drilling and production could have a negative impact on some industries such as tourism and agriculture. Really? You mean choking rural roads with thousands of trucks, contaminating water, and polluting the air might have a negative effect? on our $3.7 billion wine and tourism industries and, and our burgeoning organic agricultural movement? And what about the thousands of people who work in these existing industries and have existing jobs? Will displacing them with transient mercenaries simply be a, quote, negative externality? We are talking about the lives of real people who live in this community. And once our land is poisoned and our lakes are polluted, they will be gone forever. And that's why Ulysses and many other towns have banned hydrofracking. Uh, you are sacrificing us on an altar of stupidity and greed, but you forget who you're working for. It is not the gas industry. It is we the people. All local petitioning drives indicate the vast majority of us vehemently oppose hydrofracking. And recent local elections, I'm very happy to say, have confirmed that in spades. The DEC works for us, not the gas industry. And we are telling you loud and clear, you will never hydrofrack in the Finger Lakes, no matter what it takes. Thank you. Thank you. So speakers uh, 9 through 16 should be lined up at this point with the uh, odd numbers on, uh, uh, on this side and the even numbers on this side. Our next speaker is Andy Gladstone, number 9. Andy Gladstone, A-N-D-I-G-L-A-D-S-T-O-N-E. I live in Danby. I uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 44. I am the executive director of the New York State Breast Cancer Network, a network of over 20 grassroots breast cancer organizations that are located in communities stretching all the way from Buffalo to Long Island. Collectively, our member organizations reach over 100,000 New Yorkers every year with cancer, education, and support services. There are many ways the introduction of hydrofracking in New York State will raise our cancer risk. The costs of such increased cancer risks have been ignored in the revised SGICE. Without a detailed cancer risk analysis, the SGICE should not go forward and fracking must not go forward. With time restraints, here are just a few of those risks. One. More than 25% of the chemicals used in hydrofracking have been demonstrated to cause cancer or mutations. Hydrofracking companies use products containing 13 different known and suspected carcinogens. Two, 37% of chemicals in fracking fluids are endocrine disruptors which alter hormonal signaling and in doing so can place cells on the pathway to tumor formation. 
Exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals has been implicated in cancers of the breast, prostate, pituitary, testicle, and ovary. Three, the shale bedrock of New York State contains many highly carcinogenic substances that can be mobilized by drilling and fracturing. Traditional water filtration cannot remove these substances if and when they get into the water. Four, we are very alarmed at the practice of using radioactive production brine on New York State roads for the purposes of dust control and de-icing. This, this practice exposes unknown numbers of people without their consent to unknown amounts of known human carcinogens. Five, nationwide more than a thousand different cases of water contamination have been documented near fracking sites. Six, in Texas, breast cancer rates rose significantly among women living in six counties with the most intensive gas drilling, while by contrast, breast cancer rates declined within the rest of Texas. The President's Cancer Panel calls on state governments to take action to reduce and eliminate toxic exposures implicated in cancer before human harm occurs. This is the precautionary principle. To permit hydrofracking, which opens countless portals of toxic contamination, is antithetical to this call for action and puts all New Yorkers at greater risk of sitting in a doctor's office one day, like I did, and hearing the devastating news that changes one's life forever. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker number 10 is Mike Lane. I'm Michael Lane, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, last name Lane, L-A-N-E. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm a county legislature, legislator from the town of Dryden. I represent the east part of the town of Dryden, including the villages of Freeville and Dryden. I want to thank the town of Compton's County County of Government for putting this program on tonight. How disappointing that it wasn't DEC that held its public hearing here. Yeah. Tompkins, County, Tompkins County has been the leader in serious research, in bringing together people for their opinions, in submitting information for the environmental impact statements, and yet we have to be ignored and hold our own meeting like this and pay for it ourselves. There's something wrong in this process. My town, uh, you might say, is one of the ground zeroes in, in the uh, fight. The town of Dryden has been sued for its uh, ban of the hydrofracking process and other heavy industrial uh, activities. My town has gone recently through a uh, very serious uh, election in which hydrofracking was yes or no was the major issue. And the people of my community said no, 60-40. And that needs to be thought about in the socio and economic impacts. The reason, as people spoke about the hydrofracking process, is they are fearful of what will happen to the community. Almost 100% of the water that is drunk in my district of the town of Dryden comes from wells, municipal wells or wells on private property, hundreds of them. There is no serious protection in this document for those people, and their water is just as important as everyone else's. The, our town, uh, our village of Dryden is over a major aquifer that is not protected. Our village of Freeville is on glacial, uh, glacial underground streams, which, and they get their, their water from wells. They're not protected. There's something wrong with this system that doesn't have protection for the water that my people drink in my district, but people in the Hudson Valley or in Syracuse can have their water protected. Uh, I've, I said before, what are we, chopped liver out here? Our, our people deserve that. We deserve the equal protection under the law. And I think the DEC, as a regulator, needs to make sure that our people in Dryden and in Tompkins County and our whole region receives that equal protection. Thank you. Thank you.